So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, hmm. what's going on. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Pedro Meira <laughs> for uh, this very kind invitation to be here. And last time when he organized this event about delicate delicacy, I was actually in the audience and I made him a question about Nietzsche. And I asked that if we consider that delicacy is a virtue, Nietzsche says that virtues uh, are great for the others because then you can be exploited. And I then regretted asking that question and I still do. So in the gay science, he puts this very hard problem. If you are delicate, wouldn't that allow someone to exploit you in some extent. So it's a very pessimistic view about delicacy. And of course, I'm not going to try to answer this particular question. So don't expect it for me. I'm going to do some random comments here. Uh, don't expect any coherence in my comments as well. So what I'm going to discuss with you is just like a few ideas that I have about this issue and taking into account this provocation by Nietzsche. So basically, my presentation is divided into three parts. And the first part, I actually like to talk about delicadeza and the other. So when basically, uh, when you think about someone in Portuguese and you say that this person is delicada, you mean that this person is, for instance, attentive, that she pays attention to the others with care. So it's a slightly different meaning from when you think about delicacy or delicate in English. So you say that someone is delicada, uh, that person is really, really attentive, and she basically uh, makes uh, this possibility of turning what is not familiar into familiar. So my assumption here is that delicacy and being delicate is actually something that facilitates the contact with the other. It's something that is very important. It's either, either like a protocol or a facilitator of getting in contact with the other. And this is something that it's very well expressed by the quality of being a delicate person in Portuguese. So my, I would like to present an illustration about this uh, possibility of how delicacy actually emerges from the encounter with the other by presenting a small excerpt of the movie Solaris by Andrei Tarkovsky, in which you basically have the ultimate meeting with the other. So a psychologist is called to a space station uh, because everybody there went mad. And the space station orbits a planet which behaves like a human being. And the planet is interacting with the crew of the station, leaving them mad. And to make things worse, when he gets there, he meets uh, a reincarnation of his suicidal wife. To, his wife was dead. And to make things even worse, there is a moment in which gravity is suspended. So this is possibly the, the ultimate otherness that you can imagine. And at that moment, something extraordinary happens. And there is a moment of very beautiful delicacy that I would like to show you in this particular uh, excerpt.
So it's almost like if at that particular moment, these totally different things, a dead wife and a her husband, the planet, what's human, what's alien, came together in a sort of a, an extremely delicate moment. So that's, I think, it's a very interesting representation of how delicacy can emerge out of the otherness. So basically, we had our share of navigations. We haven't met anyone, uh, any other person uh, in the outer space, but we have like our great navigations and all the moments of indelicacy and also the moments of delicacy that emerged out of them. But my point here is that the other is actually not far in space. It's not somewhere out in uh, after a huge navigation. But the other is here and now. And we are all the time like facing these encounters uh, with the other. And the possibility of delicacy can emerge or not out of these encounters. So I'd like to uh, give an, another example of another encounter that turns out to be an indelicate encounter when Victor Hugo was actually shown uh, with a poem written by a worker. As we know, Victor Hugo was a very important sympathizer with the working class. And someone just got a poem and showed it, showed it to him and said, here's the poem of a worker. And then he said exactly the following. In your fine verse, there is something more than fine verse. There is a strong soul, a lofty heart, a noble and robust spirit. Carry on. Always be what you are, a poet and a worker. That is to say, thinker and worker. So Jacques Rancière, when he interprets this, he basically says, always be what you are so that we can continue to be what we are. So he basically has a very pessimistic view about this encounter between the poet worker and Vitor Hugo, because he basically uh, doesn't see beyond uh, the, the condition of the worker as a poet. He doesn't see his true words, but basically what he sees is his condition as a woman being of someone belonging in the working class rather than someone that can aspire to be a poet and so on. So basically, I think this is a very interesting analysis by Hansière, especially because it shows us uh, this possibility of these conflicts or, or these divergences or separations between the cultural other. And this is especially interesting for me, for instance, because I live in the city of Rio de Janeiro, and it's a city which is very uh, geographically compact, in which you have the favelas from one side and the people who live in the city on the other side, which we call they live in the asphalt. And it's very interesting because writers like uh, Zuenir Ventura created this idea of the cidade partida, the partitioned city, the divided city, in which you have like so many cultural others occupying the same geographic space, but sometimes they don't simply uh, meet each other. They live in completely separate spaces. And this is, I think, uh, a very interesting uh, met metaphor that is somewhat uh, comparable to the example of Victor Hugo. So after I do that, I'd like to share a little bit of my research experience, uh, what I've been doing in the past few years. And basically, what I've been trying to do is to research music and cultural scenes throughout Latin America, especially those who are emerging out of the appropriation of technology on the part of what we can call the peripheries. So basically, if we think that in the past 10 years, low-income populations have had the chance to be online, to have cell phones, and increasingly are doing so. It's really fantastic to see how a completely different cultural environment and cultural scenes are emerging out of this appropriation. It's something that I find one of the most interesting and enthusiastic topics to be researched and analyzed today. And so in this particular research, I've done some work in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico, in Argentina, and in Nigeria. And I was basically interested in music scenes that are emerging out of this appropriation of technology. So basically, one of the music scenes that I researched is the Tecnobrega scene uh, in Pará, the northern region of Brazil. And Tecnobrega is already the product of an encounter it's a mix between techno and, you know, 80s beats, like Kraftwerk and these sorts of electronic music, 
with brega, which is basically kitschy and cheesy music, overly romantic music. So it's probably one of the very few scenes of electronic music in the world in which people can actually dance together because generally uh, electronic music is each one on its side, like dancing alone. It's very individualistic. And techno brega emerged like something that you can actually dance in couples. So it takes place in Belém do Pará and it's extremely popular. It talks like to millions of people. Just to give you a sense, they release 400 CDs per year. 100 DVDs per year, and until very recently, it was very unknown for the rest of Brazil. So basically, these are some pictures of the Tecnobrega parties. These are the DJs. It's a very technology incentive uh, scene. As you see, this is taking place in the outskirts of Belém. It's a very poor area. This is also a picture from a party. This is the fans of Tecnobrega apparently having fun. And this is also part of the Tecnobrega scene. And this is actually where the music is sold. So the music is not sold in traditional stores, but they, they are sold in street vendors in what we call the camelos. And that's where actually the music circulates. And it's very exciting because it's a completely new network for distribution culture that doesn't go through the center. So it's the peripheries emerging and talking to the peripheries directly without the need of a sort of legitimation or going through the channels of the center in order to legitimate themselves. So this is not a particularity of Brazil. It's happening worldwide. So another scene that we researched was actually the Cumbia Vigera in Argentina, in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Cumbia, as you might know, is a very traditional style with great haircuts and so on. <laughs> And this is the traditional cumbia. So in Argentina, it, you have like a formal dressing and a lot of really, uh, let's say, old fashioned ways of uh, playing cumbia. And the vigera, because they emerge out of the vigias miserias in Buenos Aires, they basically took away all the tradition and they started to mix it with hip hop and other contemporary rhythms. They also started to talk about very hard things of urban contemporary life. So it's a product of an encounter as well. It's another encounter that I think is very interesting. This is Pablo Lescano, one of the founders of Cumbia Vigera. This is one CD from Cumbia Vigera uh, that is circulated in the streets of Buenos Aires. So it's another kind of music also emerging out of this appropriation of technology. The same can be said about Champeta, a music style that is part of the Atlantic cities in Colombia, in Barranquilla, Cartagena, and so on. And the same can be said about funky carioca or baile funk, another music style from Rio de Janeiro that is also emerging uh, more than ever. It, it exists for more than 30 years, but in the past 10 years, it really became uh, a national phenomenon in Brazil and not only from Rio. And it's very interesting because all these um, music and music scenes, they have something in common. They are considered to be a bad taste music especially by those who are in the center. So it's very interesting because this idea of being a bad taste music scene actually produces a lot of invisibility. Sometimes people, they live in Buenos Aires or in Rio, but they simply dismiss the entire music scene saying, oh, this is bad. There is even people who say that this is the product of the lack of education on the part of people. So People do music like that because they, they are not sufficiently educated. So this is simply bad taste music. It's a very indelicate position. And in order to uh, counter this indelicacy, I would like to show another indelicacy that was made by this writer called Theodore Sturgeon. He writes mostly science fiction. And Sturgeon, he created a law that is being called the Sturgeon Law and it's very well spread in popular culture. And he says that 90% of everything is crap. So basically, if you see any sort of music scene or any sort of content, or even if like it's opera, even if it's uh, whatever that is associated with high, high culture, 90% of it, it's crap. It's a very indelicate statement. But I like the flip side of this statement, that if 90% is crap, that means that possibly 10% it's good. And by agreeing that 10% might be good, it's a way of probably not dismissing these cultural scenes that are emerging. 
So you are free to realize that maybe 90% is crap, but maybe there's 10% that is good. Maybe it's 15%, maybe it's 5%, but still it's a way of not dismissing the entire cultural scene and at least trying to pay attention to it as per the Sturgeon law uh, prescribes. So that takes me to the second part of my presentation, which I would like to call the mysterious ways of delicadeza. So having all that I said into account, what I would like to say a little bit is that generally um, when we think about delicacy, sometimes we are stuck with a sort of a, a, an archetype, something that is very quiet, commensurate, agreeable, in low volume, with, with economic use of its own qualities, and so on. So generally, we identify what's delicate with these uh, characteristics. So in order to demonstrate an example of this archetype, I'd like to show you also a music and a video by Alvanotto and Ryuchi Sakamoto. Alvanotto is an artist whose name is Kasten Nikolai. He lives in, in Germany. And it's a very interesting encounter as well, because it's the piano of Ryuichi Sakamoto, which is a, an analogic sound, meeting the digitally produced sound, which is very calm and discreet, only a few beeps and blips by Alvanotto. So I think it's also a very interesting metaphor for the meeting between man and machine, something that I would like to talk a little bit later. So let's see a little bit of Alvanotto and Sakamoto. Oops. Well, I think uh, you have the idea. This is the what I'd like to show as the archetype of delicacy. However, my point is that delicacy is very difficult to grasp, and I think it often escapes the canon, and it can also be found everywhere else in different encounters and different economies of volume, scale, color, voice, and taste. And what I would like to do next is actually to show a small video by Gabi Amarantos. She's an artist of Tecnobrega. And Gabi is a very interesting representative of this Belém peripheral scene. And this video is actually fascinating because uh, I believe it's also a product of an encounter. It describes how the entire Tecnobrega scene works. What you see is basically the same scene, scene being reproduced a lot of times. So she starts like really poor. And then in the end of the video, she starts singing the song and she becomes like really rich, almost if she is a queen. And it's curious to notice how his crowd is, gets diverse. So in the end of the video, you basically see a lot of people, not only from the peripheries, but from other places, joining her crowd, including like hipsters and other outposts for urban sophistication. So it's a very interesting video. It's a clipped version of it, but I think you can have um, a good idea. And Gabi, I think it's important also to mention, she learned how to sing in an evangelical church. So it's very interesting to see uh, how this scene it evolves. So here it is. Saia vermelha, camisa preta, chegou pra abalar. Quando tu for na casa dela de buscar, ela vai preparar café coado na calcinha, só pra me enfeitiçar. E se tu for na aparelhagem, tu vai ver só, ela vai Pra abalar Quando tu for na casa dela 
I especially like the way that even the Nossa Senhora de Nazaré, Our Lady of Nazaré, gets chicer and chicer. It gets all the time more chic whenever she's progressing in the music career. So I really like this as an illustration of what's going on. And the last example is a, an excerpt by Sidinho e Doca. They are two singers of funk carioca from the Cidade de Deus. Uh, Cidade de Deus is the city of God, something that became very famous because of a new movie that is actually very violent that takes place there. And what I find here is also, it's, this is a, an invitation for an encounter. So this particular funk is called Funk da Cidade de Deus, funk from the city of God. And what they are doing is basically they are inviting people to go there to see their city. So come here and see our city. You will certainly like it. And I'm going to show them, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about it. very interesting because this song was actually analyzed in this book. It's a book published by Artur Nestrovsky, and he invited like 10 writers to write about each different songs. It's called 10 Essays About 10 Songs, and most of the songs are Aguas de Março or Aquarela do Brasil, but then there is one analysis about this particular song. And the analysis, it says like, uh, Sidinho and Doca, the singers of the song, Sidinho is the composer, they try to initiate a conversation, making an invitation. Go there, know my city. For a recipient that is certainly, uh, that is some way, uh, seems very much with the, the reader of this book. Uh, the, the listener is called doctor, the form of treatment that the Brazilian poor used to talk with the rich or the readers of books. And basically he says, the, the Choros comes back and after the doctor starts to be treated with the intimacy of the pronoun to, you, uh, flexed in, a pop, uh, in, in the popular way with all the Brazil, ha, like all the Brazilian peripheries. But you don't know, and I will tell you, but I don't know if you are ready. Not everything they say is true. We want peace, we want justice and freedom. When you have time for, to spend, uh, pay attention to what I'm talking about and go there, know my city. And then they also, he finishes, the, the, the author saying that, and still they add, as if it was a sociology class mixed with a self-help sort of class in the style of the Zen and the, the art of, uh, Impinar Pipas, uh, I don't know how to translate that, <laughs> uh, given to someone that doesn't understand anything about the people. So they say, uh, because this is the life of the people, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's bad. After the serol, which is something bad, it should certainly stop. My philosophy is peace, love, and funk. So basically, this analysis in Nestrovic's book was written by Hermano Viana, the person in the middle. And Hermano is certainly one of the most delicate people and certainly one of the smartest people I ever met 
in my life. So his work is a very strong influence to me and to so many other people. He's the author of a book called uh, O Mundo Funk Carioca, The World of Funk, that was written in the 80s. So now you actually see some scholarship about funk, but the fact that he wrote that book in the 80s is definitely something extraordinary. And he's also the author of another book called The Mysteries of Samba. So uh, just to finish this part, uh, I'd like to show a little bit about the work of Christian Boltanski. Uh, Christian Boltanski is a Swiss artist, and that's Christian. And he also has a very delicate work in which he collects pictures of dead people. And that's exactly how he describes it. I collect pictures of dead people. So this is a sample of his work. This is another sample. And what he says is that pictures, they are more about the absence of the person than about the presence of the person. So whenever you have a representation of something, uh, he makes us think that probably that representation is about the absence of that thing that is being represented. It's not about the presence of the thing that is being represented. And I think this is a very powerful idea, and it actually takes me to the third and last part of my presentation, which is about time and delicadeza. And as we all know, we are living in very indelicate times because the amount of information we are surrounded is being uh, actually collected. There's a lot of information being collected from us when we are online, sometimes even without our permission. As we navigate the internet and the digital world, something uh, that is an integral part of our contemporary world and of the future of our world, whether we like it or not, there is a representation of us being built somewhere. So basically, we are in the online world, our profile is being uh, created somewhere, and this is definitely an indication of this indelicacy of the times. And so the amount of information it not, not only creates this representation of us, but it also demonstrates how time is accelerating because of so much information that, that we have to deal with. And I think this is one of the very hard things to grasp, our relationship with time now, especially with so much information. And one of the best description of this I actually found in a video game called Braid. And in this video game, it's a very interesting thing because different from other games, you never die. If you do something wrong in this game, you actually press a button and time is reversed. And actually, you have the chance to do it all over again in a perfect way. So this is a, it brings like the possibility of reversing our mistakes. And I believe that in this hyper-connected world of ours, this has become a sort of an Olympic aspiration for many. So just would like to show you this particular video game, how it works. Then what would you be? So that's the question they make in the end. If you can reverse time, what would you be? Certainly that would be the final solution for anxiety, because if you can reverse time, you have no reason to be anxious. And that would be also a final solution for control, because I believe everyone expresses the desire to exercise control, especially in this moment in which our humanity is becoming smaller and smaller compared to the powers of information. So if I give you another example of how our humanity is getting smaller, this young Austrian student, he decided to sue Facebook in order to obtain all the data that was being collected from him. 
and he got a document that has 102, uh, 1,200 pages, so 1,222 pages, and he's 24 years old. So basically, this information is being collected from us all the time. It's his biography made in a very objective way because it definitely, definitely details the interaction of other people that he has, his habits, preferences, and so on. And so on. So I believe that this is an indication of how this issue of transparency and how it's hard for delicacy to emerge in the world that we are moving into. And another example, and I'm almost finishing, is this project by the United States government. And this is an article from the New York Times. And what they are doing is they are collecting money, collecting information from countries, like uh, creating a huge database so that they can predict the future. And that's the words. Uh, they say, the most optimistic research believe that these storehouses of big data will, for the first time, reveal sociological laws of human behavior, enabling them to predict political crises, revolutions, and other forms of social and economic instability, just as physicists and chemists can predict natural phenomena. This is a prog program by the United States government. And curiously enough, the first region in the world that was selected for this project to be developed is Latin America. So <laughs> that's a very interesting thing, and it's this idea that with enough information and with pattern recognition, you can actually predict the future. And when I mention pattern recognition, I have to mention uh, Marshall McLuhan, probably one of the most important humanists that existed and lived like in the 20th century. So McLuhan, when he, said, when he thought about these issues, when he was writing in the 60s, much before the internet, he was saying and he was making reference to an Edgar Allan Poe uh, uh, short story called A Descent into the Malmstrom. And it tells the story of an old man, and, but the old man claims that he's young and he only appears old. His appearance, he says, is justified by an encounter with the vortex while on a fishing trip with his brother, each one in separate boats. His brother is swallowed right away by the vortex, but he, out of his despair, looks at the vortex and understands how it works. He recognizes its patterns. He sees that large and spherical objects are the ones that are pulled into it faster. So he jumps out of the boat and grabs a cylindrical barrel and manages to be saved from the maelstrom furry, only to find himself turned into an old man. So basically, uh, what McLuhan is saying here is that he believes in our capacity as human beings to look at the patterns and recognize them and be able not to be uh, pulled into this particular vortex. But there is a reason that we should be pessimistic, and that is because pattern recognition is now being made by machines and not by human beings. So McLuhan could never predict the possibility that pattern recognition would transcend us, would transcend our humanity. And when you think about transcendence, I finish by mentioning uh, the writer Werner Vinge. And Werner Vinge basically says that uh, in his books, very far away in the future, millions and millions of years ahead, Computers transcend us so much that we are a mere detail in the scale of things. And the machines, they behave like gods. So it's actually funny because they have disciplines that are called applied theology, because you have to know what to do if you encounter one of these godlike uh, transcendent machines. And he says that the solution for this technology that overcome so absolutely our humanity is a sort of a return of this low zone, a zone in which our human scale is still important, is a zone where uh, our human scale can still make a difference, uh, unlike the, the, the trend that we see. And since this is an event about delicacy, I would like to finish in an optimistic way and not in a pessimistic way. And the way to do that is actually invoking uh, Charles and Ray Eames, which are a couple of designers uh, in the United States. And they were a living proof that technology and the human dimension can work together. 
design and technology, in their view, should address the human need. So they created many things, among them great pieces of furniture that are still very popular today, and are at the same time functional, and why not say it delicate? And I believe that Ray and Charles Eames, they have a very interesting view about the future, especially when they tell us a parable about the banana leaf. They say that in India, the lower castes would eat off a banana leaf as their main utensil. The higher the classes, the more sophisticated the utensil would become, being made of wood, and among the really high classes, even gold or other precious materials. But however, you can go beyond that, and the guys that have not only means, but a certain amount of knowledge and understanding, go the next step, and they eat off of a banana leaf. And I think that in these times when we fall back and regroup, that somehow or other, the banana leaf parable sort of go to get working there. Because I'm not prepared to say that the banana leaf that the one eats off uh, of is the same as the other eats off of, but it's that process that has happened within the man that changes the banana leaf. And as we attack these problems, and I hope and I expect that the total amount of energy used in this world is going to go from high to medium to a bit lower, the banana leaf idea might have a great part in it. Thank you.